another day. Okay. When you get an opportunity in this game, you make a play. Yeah. The playmakers on three. One, two, three. Perfect. Touchdown, Kansas City. The Chiefs are right in the thick of it, baby. You wanted it. You asked for it, you're getting it. Another edition of Defending the Kingdom. Hi, everybody. I'm Mitch Holtis, voice of the Chiefs, along with senior team reporter himself, Matt McMullen. Uh, Matt Stack, great job, by the way, on the uh, preseason games on the sideline. Thanks. Yeah, that's a real thrill doing that. Uh, as a kid that grew up watching those preseason broadcasts, to get to hang out with Trent Green and uh, and do those games with him and to be on the sideline is, is pretty awesome. We went on Trent's boat the night before, like nice. for a preseason dinner, and the entire time I was on the boat, just talking to him, thinking, how did I get here? <laughs> but it was pretty cool. I appreciate you saying that. I had that same feeling, 24 seasons with Len Dawson. And to lose Len last week, of course, was uh, very, very difficult. But I had that same feeling so many times because, I, as I said in the opening of the broadcast, uh, in the game against Green Bay as an eight-year-old, I'd watch half the game and then – my farm would magically turn into Municipal Stadium, and I'd have my stenciled 16 jersey, and I would magically be in Len Dawson, and then for 24 magic years, I was on his side. So understand that feeling. All right, the other feeling here is what we're calling this edition the 53 Wet Cement. Now, I have to ask you a question before we get into Around the World. Did you ever pour cement? I did not, no. Okay. I, was, right. I was a camp counselor when I was in high school. Never yeah. poured cement, though. Well, uh, so I did it one summer uh, working for a man named Steve Levine. He's a huge Chiefs fan. Um, I'm not sure where he's at now. He's like in the Wichita area, Kensington, Kansas. Great, great family. But we poured cement. It made a base and put up uh, metal buildings and, and um, grain bins. But it was fascinating and very interesting work, uh, intricate work, I should say. So you pour it, you trowel it. You know, you massage a little bit. Sometimes we had to put in bolts, uh, but it was then wet. And once you had it done, you kind of had it troweled and roughed where you're going to rough it. You had uh, forms around it, and then you let it set. And you hope some dog like your dog Pip wouldn't run across <laughs> it because yeah. it would just destroy everything. And then we also know that there are places like you, you do it in a backyard, but your kids put their handprint in it. Yeah. Right. And you look at it 50 years later and like, look at Matt's handprint from uh, long ago. But this is what cement the Chiefs have announced their 53 man roster for now uh, for 2022. We always anticipate this day. It's a day of uh, man, it's just so much excitement, but there's also so much sadness because so many guys get cut or waived or released. And we're going to get into the definition of all that. But before we get into our wet cement, uh, and it is wet, so don't step on it or have your dog run across it, let's go around the world before yeah. we do anything. Yeah, let's do it. So as always, 13 names and places, people all over the place listening to Defending the Kingdom. So and that's we, for the 13 seconds, right? You oh, can yeah. Get, you can get a lot done in 13 seconds. You sure can. Yeah, <laughs> we're, and we're keeping this going here. Um, yeah. So 13 names and places. We have Michael, who is originally from Springfield, Missouri. But he's now in Winona, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. He declares it Chief's Kingdom Driftless, which if you know that area, that area is called the Driftless Area. Yeah, that's so, right on the Mississippi River. Yeah. Winona State University. Yeah, he actually works there. Oh, he does. He's a professor there. Yeah. Fantastic. So shout out to Michael. We've got Josh in Salina, Kansas. He sent me a picture of his bulldozer. And there's a Chief's helmet like right by the uh, controls of the bulldozer. That's it awesome. was awesome. Yeah. So a Kingdom Defender on his bulldozer out in Salina. <laughs> We've got Bruce in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Ken in Nairobi, Kenya. Home of Western Kentucky University. We've got educators on this uh, show. Anyway. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, Ken in Nairobi, Kenya. Okay. Uh, Rodney in Marshall, Missouri. Pedro in Sao Paulo. Home of Missouri Valley College. These are all college towns. Yeah, just keep going. Nairobi, I know, has got something, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Um, Pedro in Sao Paulo. Do you know what's in Sao Paulo? I'm sure there's something there. It's got to be. Yeah. yeah University yeah. of Brazil. Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Uh, we've got Austin in Boise, Idaho. Boise, Boise State. State. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he started watching the Chiefs because his fiance's parents lived in Kansas City. He didn't have a team and just decided to watch the Chiefs, and he says he thinks he made the right decision. <laughs> you see how evangelism works? It comes all way, shape, or form, right? Through work or usually through ladies, right? So that's how he was evangelized to the kingdom. I love it. Yeah, and he's not the only one from Idaho that commented. We had another listener, didn't give their name, but they're also from Idaho. So quite a contingent of people from Idaho listening. Not Napoleon Dynamite, though. No, not yet. Okay, he was from or Idaho. Uncle Rico. Yeah. Uh, we, we've got Mark in New Jersey, uh, Jay and Lee from Sunrise Beach, Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, Nivek from Moss Bluff, Louisiana, 
Joe in Nevada, Sam in Thailand, and then Parker in Salt Lake City, Utah. Oh, man, those are so cool. Yeah. And just the kingdom, is its impact and ever-growing now in one of the most popular franchises, not just in the National Football League, but in professional sports overall. And in Idaho. And in, <laughs> and in Idaho. And to pull you to Uncle Rico, <laughs> we know we'll hear from you next. Uh, the wet cement – uh, of the 53-man roster, meaning it's the forms are poured. Yes, we've troweled it, but it's still wet, so don't step on it, and it could change. We're going to get into how fluid the 53 can be, even within a matter of days. And there's some bits of history here with the Chiefs with it, but again, why we're calling it wet cement is this isn't the final pour yet. It hasn't dried because it could change. It could. You said the word fluid, and that's the best way to describe this. We're recording this on Tuesday. The roster cuts just came out about an hour ago, and by the time you're listening to this, it's very possible that some moves have been made. That's how fluid this truly is. And the biggest distinction to know that we're going to talk about here is the difference between being waived and being released. And there's a big distinction. If you go to the Chiefs website and see the press release that said the players that have been cut, some of them are released, some of them are waived. If you're waived, what that means is you're a younger player, so you've accrued less than four seasons in the NFL. It's kind of complicated. What's an accrued season? All that stuff. Just think of it this way. If you are a younger player who hasn't played a whole lot in the NFL, you are waived. And what that means is you are uh, basically able to be claimed by any team. Any team can say, hey, I want that player, and then you have to go to that team based on the waiver order and all of that. But if you're waived, essentially other teams can claim you. If you are released, and players that are released are veterans that have been around for longer than four years, think older players, uh, those guys don't have to be subject to waivers. They're just free agents and can sign with anyone, including back with the Chiefs. So that's an important thing to know when you see these players that are cut. Are they waived or are they released? And over the next 48 hours, the players that are waived, they'll go through the whole system. Teams will make their claims. You can find some good players on the waiver wire this time of year. So we'll see what happens over the next two days. But the important distinction to know is the difference between being waived and being released because it's a big one. There's even waived injured. Matt Bushman here, I think, has been waived injured. He was the tight end, had the two tight ends, two touchdowns, I should say, against Green Bay, and then was injured later. He's been waived injured. Uh, but, again, a younger player, so he is waived. Just a couple of stories here that accentuate your point about this being fluid and the way versus injured. In Coach Reed's first year, you alluded to it, on a Saturday night, there were seven players that thought they made the Kansas City Chiefs in 2013. Now, keep in mind, the Chiefs had the first waiver position. They were the worst team in the National Football League in 2012. So, of all the waived guys, the Chiefs had the first pick, basically. On that Saturday night, seven different guys were picked up by the Kansas City Chiefs. I called them the Magnificent Seven after the Western uh, Series. But seven guys thought they made the team Saturday night. When they came to work Sunday morning, they were waived. And the Chiefs picked up seven other wave players and Ron Parker was one of those. I mean, there were guys out of the Magnificent. Sean McGrath. They were they were key in a nine and start in twenty and twenty thirteen. So the other one a story, just bear with me here, indulge me here, Kingdom Defenders. This is how it can be cruel. The the kickoff lunch is is a big deal. Um, I get to announce the team uh, to a crowd of I don't know a thousand people in the community and Coach Reed and Brett Veach talk and some of the team leaders. But it was when still Mar- Marty Schottenheimer was still coach. And a guy named Bjorn Nitmo was a kicker who had come from nowhere. The Chiefs were just auditioning kickers like crazy, and he had worked construction, and he made it. And I announced him, you know, from blah, blah, construction, and I think Washington State or something, and he made it, and he just – he was up on the stage and so happy, just waving his fists, and, and uh, he had fought off three other f- guys to make the team. I go sit down after announcing the team. Marty Schottenheimer goes, we just cut, we just cut Nip. Oh, man. We just traded for Pete Stoyanovich, and we're gonna, I got to go tell that guy he's cut yeah. after he thought you know, it was his birthday party. So it's how cruel these can be. So I, you and I are both not callous to this. No. We get to know these guys. And uh, it's just like any of you lost your job. It's, it's very, very difficult. So the waived release thing is very important to understand, and you did an awesome job explaining it. The other thing to understand here is practice squad because a lot of the players who are waived uh, or released 
can be on the practice squad, but the practice squad rules, COVID really changed it uh, a lot because now the practice squad has truly become kind of a developmental area. I call it the crock pot, right? You put guys in the crock pot, they simmer and they come out and they can be great players. But there's also veteran players that can go. So quickly, the practice squad rules. 16 players on the practice squad, most ever. Uh, they've made this rule in the offseason. Uh, think of six over ten here. You can have six players with unlimited experience in the National Football League. Let's, let's say Chad Henney, who is setting, what, at 15 years of NFL experience, can actually go on your practice squad. He can be one of your 16 guys, but only six of those. And then ten players must be two or less accrued seasons. So think six over ten here. Four can be protected because if you go to the practice squad, you can be – claimed by another team got to clear waivers claimed by another team uh and but four can be protected so let's say the Chiefs did put Chad Henney on there they would probably protect him there's four that you nobody can touch those four but the other 12 if you want to put them on your 53-man roster you can pluck them off the Chiefs practice squad think of Harrison Butker here he was on the Cincinnati practice squad lost a kick contest with Graham Gano they put him on the practice squad Chiefs claimed him in early October and he's been the Chiefs kicker ever since October of 7, 2017. So it's important to know that. And then the up and down here. You can now take a player. You can take two practice squad players and activate them for a game day. And you can do that with a, a player three separate times during the year. They've really liberalized, liberalized these practice squad rules. If the fourth time it happens, though, that player must go on the 53-man roster. And every one of those moves – um, counts uh, against eight that you can do uh, eight times uh, 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 that you can do a one player twice, but it counts against eight times that you can move guys up and down. So anyway, they've really made the practice squad a true developmental area. You ever watch Game of Thrones? <laughs> A little bit, yes. So I'm I, not a Game of Thrones just head, <laughs> everything memorized, but yes. Well, I started watching House of the Dragon oh, now, and it's... so it, it's fully sucked me back in. But <laughs> that got my wife thinking that we should restart Game of Thrones. So we restarted it, and we're on like episode three. And it's the episode where they're trying to figure out uh, if the king's kids are actually the king's kids, and Ned Stark has the giant book like this big, looking through all the histories of Westeros and everything to figure out that actually the kids are not the king's kid because they don't have brown hair. It's all to say that if you're trying to figure out the practice squad rules and all these rules, it's like reading a book this <laughs> thick. And Mitch and I every day are trying to figure out what exactly are the rules now because they change every single year and they're complicated. The beauty of our front office is they can figure out the ways to take advantage of these rules and to utilize them the best way to keep as many good players here in town as possible. And you mentioned how the practice squad, the, the, the way it's used is so different now because it, it used to be essentially extremely young and experienced players and they're there for emergencies and to be the scout team. That's what it used to be. Well, now it's essentially a taxi squad. It's extra players who are experienced, who have been around. Many veterans are on it. You mentioned six of them. You can have guys who are legitimate, bona fide NFL players on that practice squad, and you don't look at them as practice squad players. You know, So that's a big difference now from what it used to be. And it's one of the ways that the pandemic and the way it changed the rules almost ended up being a positive in a lot of ways. And I'm so glad the league decided to keep those rules. Because there's several veteran players that were cut today on Tuesday. Again, things can change in the time after this. But today on Tuesday, guys like Darius Fountain, Josh Gordon, Austin Ryder, uh, those are veterans who have been around who in the past would not be eligible for the practice squad, and now they are. Corey Coleman. Corey Coleman's another yeah. great example. I mean, we could go on and on. Lots of good players uh, who were released today, but in theory, the way the rules are set up could be on the practice squad and could then be elevated at some point during the season. So, and, many, and many of those players will be. I exactly. Mean, that, so that'll be announced. Again, we're taping this on uh, Tuesday. By Wednesday, end of business, basically, they'll, those practice squads will be announced. Uh, so, yeah, so look for a lot of those guys. But, you know, Taylor Stallworth, uh, maybe um, uh, Danny Shelton per perhaps could be on that group that goes to that veteran six and then also maybe even a guy like nazi johnson though because it's still useful for young players who maybe yeah. weren't quite ready but maybe can get some reps in the practice squad still be around the building like that's still really beneficial for those guys so we'll see how it uh, shapes up
But we'll yeah. get through waivers, get through all of that, and see what guys are still around. Or an offensive lineman like Mike Caliendo fits that category as well. All right, let's get into another one here. But the practice squad, uh, again, important. But it's also an answer, too, I think, because people have said, why don't you expand the ro- rosters? You only have 53. Seven have to be inactive on game day. You really play a game with 46. Wait a minute, three of those are specialists. You're really playing a game with 43. So – High school teams will be playing this weekend with more players than the NFL teams play with on a weekend. But when you add 16 practice squad guys, you, in essence, make it a 69-player pool that you've got for all 32 teams. So a good move by the league, in, in my opinion, there. Let's go into something quick, and then we're going to get an overall thought about this team, is the IRDFR, meaning injured reserve and injured reserve designated for return. More numbers. Go back to your book <laughs> Back here. to the book. Yeah. Game of Thrones. <laughs> Who's he belong to? Um <laughs> But important here because I think one immediate move will be in this category by the Kansas City Chiefs, and I think of Blake Bell here, had the hip injury, the surgery. But injured reserve and designated to return, they have also given a lot of leeway in those rules, and they become important if you're a Chiefs follower of the roster. Yeah, I remember during training camp when we were talking about injured reserve with some fans, they would say, well, can't we just put so-and-so on injured reserve and then – designate them to return at some point during the season and you can't during training camp or before right now actually the only way a player on injured reserve can come back during the season at any point is if they are on the opening 53 roster so a player like Blake Bell who is a candidate uh, to be put on injured reserve he has to be on the initial 53 today you couldn't put him on IR previously or his season would automatically already be over so you have to have him on the 53 today and then you can move him to IR. But what that means is it takes a spot from somebody else. So you have to be thinking about this if you're Brett Veach in the front office, knowing who's a player that we can maybe release and then immediately bring back. And that's where the roster math is so important here this time of year. But uh, yeah, if you want to bring a player back at any point who is on injured reserve, they have to be placed on injured reserve today after already initially for like five minutes being on the 53-man roster so it's complicated but those are the rules and you tell players won't say who we can we can guess but hey don't go far yeah right just stay in the car and uh let us make this move but look for that those moves to happen very very quickly and then a have to have a minimum of four games before returning so let's say blake bell goes on irdfr he must set the first four weeks under these rules, eight players are permitted now to be put on IR, which is, a again, a loosening of these rules. But And one player can go twice. So Blake Bell can, in essence, if he goes on IR, DFR, can go on again, but that count against the eight. Uh, but, again, just follow that. IR doesn't mean your season's over, which it used to be, and it does if you're in training camp in the case of Derek, of Derek Gore. Gore. Yeah. All right, let's get into your defensive reaction uh, and your thoughts overall of how right now in the wet cement, keep in mind it's wet, uh, don't touch it, don't put your handprint in it, but the defense and how it shapes up right now. Well, a few guys that I'm excited about. Uh, The first one is Jalen Watson. I'm so excited Jalen Watson made this team. So he was the number 243 overall pick (laughs) in the draft, a seventh rounder, uh, one of several seventh rounders for the Chiefs, and it was no guarantee he was going to make the team. When you're a seventh-round draft pick, yeah, you were drafted, but you're a seventh-rounder. You don't know for sure. You have to fight for that roster spot. And coming out of school, I already liked him because of his height. He's six foot three. The Chiefs haven't had a lot of length at corner over the years, and they really invested in that position, trying to find taller corners uh, this offseason. And he was one of those. And I was hopeful um, he could make this team because I think he has a lot of traits and the athleticism to grow into a solid uh, cover corner in the NFL. And we saw that throughout training camp. I mean, his growth was exponential, I think. We saw him working at times with the second team and with the first team. He was rotating in there getting a lot of reps and earning the trust of his coaching staff that was very clear and that continued in the preseason as well he had 59 coverage snaps during the preseason and if you look at pff pro football focus grades he had the third best coverage grade among all players with at least 20 or more coverage snaps you hope that success in practice translates to the games and it did he was outstanding in the preseason and those growing pains are going to continue as he gets into regular season games but i'm so glad the jalen watson experiment worked out at least so far and then two players on the defensive line who I'm really proud of for making it to this point are Joshua Kando and Malik Herring uh, both edge rushers Joshua Kando had 49 snaps against the Packers that was tied for the most of any defender 
in that third preseason game goes to show that these preseason games matter. Uh, we don't know the specifics, but there's a reason he played so many snaps. The Chiefs were trying to get a good look at him, and he clearly showed them something. So good for Joshua Kendo um, making this initial 53-man roster. Six foot seven. I mean, crazy athlete. Uh, got hurt last year, but he was a fourth round pick as recently as um, 2021. So you see what you can uh, find in a guy like that. Give him more reps, see what he can do in the regular season. But excited for Joshua Kendo. And Malik Herring is also a great story. Uh, it was tough for him because if you go back to not this past off season, but two off seasons ago, he was uh, coming out of school at Georgia and he went to the Senior Bowl and he likely would have gotten drafted, but he blew out his knee down in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. And what's so great about the Chiefs is they still keep tabs on all these guys. And even though he was hurt, he went undrafted, but they signed him as an undrafted free agent following the draft. He spent all year last year in this building rehabbing, studying the playbook, trying to prepare himself mentally, doing everything he could without actually physically doing anything on the field. He had his first opportunity to take the field during rookie minicamp, and he was awesome. I was texting you. I was like, Malik Herring is balling out at rookie <laughs> minicamp. Like, good for him, his first opportunity. And then he clearly showed something throughout training camp but during the preseason where uh, he made this roster. So you got to think for Malik Herring, this was a very adverse, difficult situation. And we don't know what the future will hold for him, but at least to make this opening 53 like he did uh, says a lot about him. So good for him. Let me add two onto that list that you've got of the defensive guys that have made it on our wet cement 53. Is Joshua Williams at corner because he's he's kind of the yin and yang of, of Jalen Watson, but a Division two player came out of nowhere HBCU school. Division two guys can make it. They thrive in this league. They can make it. Division three guys have become Pro Football Hall of Famers. It doesn't matter the level that you play at, and to see him and the athletic talent. In fact, I just saw him. We had a little chat before we started this episode of Defending the Kingdom. But to see he and a Jalen Watson basically just climb up as a seventh rounder and as a, and a Division II player is, hard, is good to see. Let me throw in another one. And you mentioned kind of Malik Herring hanging in there. Colin Saunders deserves some mention. Oh, here. yeah. Out of Western Illinois. This is his fourth year with the team. He was on the 2019 Super Bowl team, got hurt. Uh, and then it was like on the brink of, is he going to make it or not make it? He came back this summer and spring and in training camp in St. Joseph as such a force. And in the preseason games, he flashed. And like Colin is back because we knew at Western Illinois he was a splendid athlete running slot receiver <laughs> as a defensive 300-plus pound lineman. But those two guys come to mind as well in making the wet cement 53. All right, let's go to the offensive side, and then we'll close this out. Uh, and on the offensive side, a few interesting things, too. In the category that you were talking about, Justin Watson uh, becomes a guy that, okay, played four years with Tampa Bay, uh, mostly special team snaps, but – there was enough there that you're going, hey, what's this guy like? And Patrick Mahomes tipped us off early on from his workouts in <laughs> Fort Worth back in April that who is this guy and how fast is he? Uh, well, there's only five wide receivers on the wet cement 53. He's the fifth, but really good player. He showed up in the uh, preseason games, obviously, the, the plays against Chicago and, and others, the big play against Washington flashing in those games. Uh, so that comes to mind. Uh, the running back situation is really interesting. And your seventh-round pick here that jumps up off the page, two seventh-round picks made the wet cement 53. And Isaiah Pacheco is an incredible story, uh, having both his uh, brother and his sister, who he was really close to, both murdered in separate instances, stayed at Rutgers. He could have transferred. Um, had never been to a National Football League game <laughs> until he played at one. Uh, <laughs> but here he is making the wet cement 53-man roster, and he, he, to me, is the Jalen Watson story of the offense. Yeah, because you take a player like Isaiah Pacheco, looking at his athletic traits, what you remember about him when you met with him and interviewed him, but you really you can't know. You don't know. He's a seventh-round pick, and it says a lot that both him and Jalen Watson were able to make this team because this isn't a situation where the Chiefs had a bunch of draft picks and they're all probably going to make it because we need all the talent that we can find. This is a really good team with a lot of players competing for roster spots, veterans competing for roster spots, and it says a lot about both Jalen Jalen and Isaiah, that despite all the competition on a team like the Chiefs, who has been to four straight conference title games, that they were able to make it. And they're going to help us win this year. 
10 draft picks, nine made the wet cement, 53. Wow. That is crazy. So you've got 20% of your team basically that are rookies, and they will be all over the field in week one against the Arizona Cardinals. Another guy that deserves mention here is Nick Allegretti. I thought he made a big jump in his career during this offseason and this training camp. He allowed the Chief, he gives you that center guard combo. So if something would happen to Creed Humphrey, let's hope that doesn't happen, Nick Allegretti gives you uh, every confidence that he could play center because the Chiefs kept nine offensive linemen in the wet cement 53. But of those four backups, we know who the starters are, but of the four backups, three are tackles, really, and because Darian Kennard made it uh, to this point and uh, one of the nine draft picks. But the others are really tackles that don't play guard. But that's why Nick Allegretti is so important to this team. He's the ultimate Swiss Army knife on this offensive line. We were watching in OTAs when he would go in for one snap at every single position and just keep rotating through. It shows how versatile he is. He's the ultimate chess piece for Andy Heck uh, and for Coach Reed. One other guy to mention, because he deserves it, is Shane Bouchelle. Yeah. So Shane Bouchelle, as a quarterback, is in a tough situation where – the quarterback here in Kansas City is the best quarterback in the NFL. And he ain't going anywhere. He's not going City. anywhere, no. And the backup is Chad Henney, who has been around forever. Uh, he's essentially an extension of the coaching staff, I think. And when called upon in 2020, he went in a playoff game and threw the ball on fourth down in the divisional round of the postseason. So he's shown what he can do as a backup. It's a tough situation for Shane Bouchel because he has to show that he is invaluable. He has to show that I am a young player who can really grow on this offense and you have to keep me around. And to his credit, I mean, he showed that in the preseason. His preseason numbers, he completed 31 of 51 passes for 335 yards, three touchdowns. He had a passer rating north of 135 against the Packers. So you hope that Shane Bouchelle never has to play in a regular season game. But with Chad Henney getting older, you hope that maybe Shane Bouchelle can be that guy who's that backup for 10 years behind Patrick Mahomes. You want them to have that relationship. And you want Shane Bouchelle eventually to be an extension of the coaching staff. And to his credit, uh, at least so far, I think he's shown that, that he's going to be an invaluable part of that quarterback room moving forward. So good for Shane for making this team. And he did it two years in a row. Because that last year's preseason, he had the rally against Arizona, uh, and he proved that he could win games, and then he backed it up this year with an even better performance. So tip of the cap to Shane Bouchelle, who could take Chase Daniels' uh, <laughs> seminar on you too can make generational wealth by being a backup <laughs> quarterback for 15 years. Uh, he's a charger, though. I just can't get that. I know, I know. Uh, anyway, it's he was here. Bad. Love that guy. Um, called, he could be governor of two states at one time. <laughs> so the forms are up. The cement's been poured. We've even had the trowel out. We've troweled it. Just don't touch it because the cement is still wet. He's Matt McMullen. I'm Mitch Holtis. It's time to start this season, and stay tuned. Ten, five, touchdown! Lock it down! And the celebration begins in our-